This week, I'm throwing a handful of dinner plates, first from this angle, and then I'll be throwing another one from a bird's eye view later on. I've been keeping aside some reclaim that's incredibly soft for these. Using firm clay can make the process of throwing dinner plates far more difficult than it need be, as ultimately, for a plate, you're simply squashing the clay downward rather than pulling it up into a thinly walled vessel. And for taller, more complex pots, firm clay can actually be helpful as it takes longer for it to degrade as it's covered in water and slip. But for these plates, none of that matters, so the clay can be unreasonably soft, which makes centering the clay and squashing it down into a low flat disc far easier. To begin with, I raise myself up. This way, when I'm wedging up a larger lump, I can simply use my upper body weight to manipulate the clay rather than just using the muscles in my arms and shoulders. You also don't want to be too low in comparison to your workbench as you'll end up hunching your shoulders and it makes the process of spiral wedging quite uncomfortable and painful. So being at the right height for the amount of clay you're working with is vital. Just like when you're throwing a pot on the wheel, you don't want to be too high or too low on your stool and what you're looking for is that perfect spot. And of course, this is different for everyone. This process of spiral wedging forces the clay into a spiral that gets ever smaller and smaller beneath your hands. And as the folds get smaller, the pockets of air are stretched and popped and the entire mass slowly comes together into one even texture with no hard lumps on the outside or soft spots. And only then is the clay ready to be used and thrown on the wheel. All these scrapings are just immediately thrown into my reclaimed bucket, where they'll break down into a slurry and they can be recycled and thrown into new pots eventually. The first thing I need to do though, is to throw the pad of clay on my wheel, onto which my throwing bats will attach to. My wheel does have holes for pins. Into these holes you stick little metal studs that protrudes upwards onto specially made bats that slot over them. I don't have any of those, so instead I just use MDF throwing bats. They aren't perfect, by any means. I make sure to use both sides so they don't warp too much, and I attach them to the wheel by first throwing a pad of clay over the top of the wheel head. And this is another instance where soft clay really helps. And with this lump, all I'm going to do is centre it as best I can, and then in a very similar way to how I make dinner plates, I'll just progressively squash it down into a low, flat disc. I'll then use a heat gun to quickly dry this clay so it's more or less leather hard, which is important if you intend to repetition throw on bats like this, as you don't want each new bat pressed onto the pad of clay to make the pad of clay itself thinner, as doing so would mean that the pots you're making, if you are using a throwing gauge, will progressively get lower and lower. So I make sure to dry out this pad of clay to leather hard and when I attach the bats themselves, I don't slam them down very hard. Instead I'll centre them, and then I'll rub them back and forth, left and right, a few times. And I let friction do the work of sticking the bat in place, instead of using the brute force method of giving the bat a mighty smack. Once the disc shape is there, I scrape off the slip and make it as flat as it can be. And then I'll spend a couple of minutes blasting it with a paint stripper, making sure I move it constantly so it doesn't heat up one patch too much, as otherwise the clay can crack. I then make sure the clay is flat, and then I score in a couple of lines, like so. And generally speaking, I'll leave a bat on the wheel like this for the week. And if I do decide to throw without bats, I'll simply place a wooden MDF throwing bat on top of this and throw the pots on that. It might seem inefficient, but making this only takes about 5 minutes or so. And I know there are better ways, or more efficient setups, but this works for me. I then sprinkle some water over the clay and rub a wet hand onto the back of the bat. It's then placed down and tap centred, the friction of which is often enough to hold it down very securely. I then just give it a slight wobble back and forth. And that's it, usually. Next, it's time to weigh out the clay for the plate itself, which is always more than I think. I threw these plates from three pounds of stoneware clay, which is 1,360 grams. And as you can see, this clay is really soft, and I'll just give it a quick wedge just to accumulate all those different weighed out pieces. And as this is being thrown low, not tall, the softness of this clay really doesn't matter, but it still does need a good wedge to make sure there are no pockets of air inside. And all I'm doing here is spiral wedging the clay much like I was at the beginning of this video, only on a much smaller scale. And when I finish wedging it, I roll it up in such a way that it has a rounded base, 
That way I can slam it onto the wheel head without the lump of clay trapping any air beneath it. And even the tapering shape at the top is made to look like this purposefully as I can easily grasp around this rounded shape to center it. The one thing I do find with these bats is it does help to add a tiny amount of water underneath like so. Not so it's soaking wet, but damp as it'll help the clay stick to the wheel. I don't find this is necessary though when I'm throwing on the metal wheel head and you certainly shouldn't add too much water as otherwise the lump of clay won't stick to the bat and it'll come flying off as soon as you add any pressure to the outside of the lump. The other thing I almost immediately do is seal the bottom here where the clay meets the wood just by pushing in my little finger to create a groove. And doing this just makes sure that the lump is firmly attached to the wood. And then I'll begin to cone the clay up and down and you can see that just with a little bit of pressure there's a slight undulation on the top. And ultimately I want to be able to cone the clay and for it to stay nice and flat. Before I begin to cone the clay properly I make sure that the top is rounded. If you don't do this, as the clay is pushed up, a well can form in the middle of the cone which ends up trapping slip in water and can even create large air pockets. So instead, as I force the clay down and before I do each cone, I make sure that the top of the mass is round. This process of coning causes the platelets, which are the particles that make up clay, to gradually become more and more aligned with each other and in doing so the mass becomes easier to work. When it comes to pushing the cone of clay down, I do so at an angle like so. This causes the clay to build up down here rather than up in my hands, which can become quite unwieldy, but then after a certain point I can just push it directly downward. I'll repeat this process a number of times, and that number can change depending on what I'm making and what the clay feels like at this stage. Sometimes I won't cone the clay up at all, like with my mugs or my medium bowls, as there is a way to centre a slightly offset rim as you pull the clay up but I'll show you how I do that in more detail in a future video. As for throwing this plate, the process is simple after it's been centered. It's just a matter of gradually forcing it down. And I do this mostly just by pushing down with the side of my hand, which pushes down directly over the very middle of the piece of clay, not off to one side. And as I push down with my right hand, my left hand is just there, pressing in slightly to keep the outermost edge under control. I may even use the palm of my hand to push down directly in the middle and then I draw that clay horizontally across the bat. There isn't much I need a throwing gauge for at this stage. I just push the clay down across the bat and when I can only see about a centimetre or two of wood left on the throwing bat, I know it's time to start forming the walls. And before I get to that point, I do one last pass with my fingertips pushing down quite firmly just to make it as level as I can. And then I begin to pinch up the outermost portion of the wall and I throw it upwards first to gain some height. And it's this section which I'll momentarily lean outward, which becomes the encircling flange of the plate. But first, I just spend a moment or two cleaning up the inside portion. I push down with a rubber kidney to flatten and compress the clay, running the rubber tool back and forth in making sure it's as flat as it can physically be. I then take the walled section and begin angling it out. And as I do this I keep some fingers pressed around the rim section just to keep it under control. And that's really the basic form of the pot finished. From this point onwards it's really just the case of cleaning up the form so that it's neat and ready to be removed from the wheel. I begin by removing as much slip from the pot as I physically can. And then I use a chamois leather to soften and smooth the rim. I soak it in water and then drape it carefully over the clay. And as the clay passes through like a template, it evens it out and it means any marks left on the rim are the same all the way around. Once I've thrown the first plate, I can adjust my throwing gauge. I then lower the arm and position the rubber point so it sits just beside the rim of the thrown plate. I want the two pieces to be about a millimeter or so away from each other and I need to be able to flip the pointer up and down without it coming into contact with the pot. I then scrape away the excess clay from around the base of the plate using an ancient blunted metal turning tool, which was never initially made for this job, but the metal is so smooth and rounded on this now that it works incredibly well and it doesn't really scratch the metal or the wood. And in any rate, I try to let the metal glide just above the wood or metal of the wheel heads, as opposed to firmly pushing it into them. I then use a rubber kidney to scrape most of the slip 
off the MDF bat, both from the top surface and the edge. And then lift my throwing gauge up so I can easily get my wire onto the other side of the pot. And then I very carefully drag the wire all the way underneath, keeping it taut the entire time so the wire doesn't bow upward and gouge away more clay than I'd like. I'd say this process alone is the most difficult part of making plates. I then loosen the bat in a few places as opposed to prying it away from one place, which might bend the form unnecessarily so. It's then set aside and I'll dry these out really slowly to leather hard. And here we go again, but from a bird's eye view. I sprinkle some water onto the clay bat and rub some slip from the wheel onto the MDF. If too much slip or water is placed between these, there's a high chance that the bat itself will become dislodged, especially during the coning up and down process when quite a lot of torque is applied to the lump of clay. I then slam it down firmly, and if it needs to be repositioned to be a little bit more in centre, then that's fine, as long as the lump itself doesn't detach as you push it into the middle. I then seal the clay to the bat with my little finger, and then the coning can begin. You can see the divot on this that I try to avoid, so on my next cone, I'll make sure that the top of the piece of clay is rounded. I firmly squeeze my palms together and force the clay up and keep the top under control with my thumb if needs be. If at any time throughout this process I feel friction, I simply use my right hand to scoop up some more water or slip and cover the lump of clay with it. And then once it's coned into a narrow length, I'll then angle it and push it back down. And like before, I'll repeat this process a handful of times, and perhaps even more so than usual, as this is reclaim I'm using to throw with, as opposed to fresh clay from the bag. So there's bound to be more inconsistencies in the clay. And sometimes if I need more lubricant, I simply drag the slip off the bat and use that. Or as my wheel tray fills up with slip over a couple of days, I can begin to take it from there too. And now the pushing down can really commence. And from this view, you can really see how the clay spreads out. My right hand now pushing down with a lot more force than my left hand is pushing in. And as the clay is so soft, it moves around with such ease. And it's for the centering and flattening process that this makes all the difference. And believe me, I've spent days using really firm clay to make plates and really soft clay to make plates. And a day spent pushing down really firm clay to form pots like this can be exhausting, not to mention the wedging. Now that the clay disc is nearing the edge of the throwing bat, I'll do one last pass with my fingertips to even out the surface and make the clay as flat as I can. And when I bring this spiral to the edge, I'll leave some of that excess in that outer portion as it's the outermost part that's going to be thrown up into the flange. So I take this area and I squeeze it with my fingertips pinching the clay walls upward. And once these short walls are about three to four centimeters tall, I'll then begin to push with my inside hand out, angling the wall over. So the rim of the plate meets the throwing gauge's pointer, which if you look very carefully, you can just about see on the top left of the plate. And now that the rough form is there, I'll remove much of the slip and water from the inside surface. And with this plate, I went straight to my metal kidney to clean up the surface which I hold very steadily with two hands before slowly easing it into the clay and forcefully pushing that flat edge right into the base portion of the plate. And in doing so, you can see the drier clay it reveals underneath. Typically, you want most of your pot to have this dry surface before you lift it off the wheel. They'll dry out more quickly and you never want to leave pots completely soaked with slip as if they are thrown thinly, there's a chance that slip can cause the pot to collapse. I then do one last pass over the inside surface to make sure it's flat, and then I drape the chamois leather over the rim to compress it and smooth it and neaten up the form. The spiral's hypnotic, isn't it? You must subscribe to Florian Gadsby. Next I go back to the blunted trimming tool to remove excess clay from the base, which I'll do in a couple of passes as opposed to trying to gouge it all away in one movement, as if too much clay gathers on the tool at once, there's a chance it builds up so much that it then pushes into the rim and deforms the plate. So I do it bit by bit, and clay that comes off like this, relatively dry, I usually stack in its own little pile, which immediately goes back into the bag of clay on the table, as opposed to going in the reclaim. I then hold the wire as tautly as possible and carefully drag it underneath the plate. And that's the plate finished. Now I'll let these dry out really slowly over a couple of days 
and then I'll trim them, which will be the topic of next week's video. Thanks so much for watching, as always, and I'll see you next week.